So, uh, so our next talk is going to be given by Katie Barnhart from CU Boulder. I'm going to do a quick sound and slide check. There's a green thing blowing. Up. How about now? 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 Okay. Okay. If it doesn't work, then it's easier to just work. Uh, I think. Yeah, Mark is good. All right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. That's writer. Okay. Oh, it sounds like someone in the back is adjusting their Okay. Katie's going to be telling us about testing landscape evolution models. Well, thank you and good morning. And I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak. And um, thank you, Allison, for a great introductory talk. Um, I want to start by asking the question, how do we invert observations such as the topography shown here for information about geomorphic and tectonic processes. So obviously, the topography contains information, the slope area and hypsometric uh, relationships of the fluvial terrain that we can see here on um, the side of the slide are clearly different from the glaciated landscape shown here. But does the topography of the fluvial terrain contain information about the correct tools used to represent the incision of rock by rivers over geologic time? And what about the uncertainty in constraining tectonic processes from the shape of something like the, um, of a fault scarp? So I'd like to ask the question, under what conditions does the topography and other related quantities retain enough information to invert for these desired parameters? And, and when are we sort of lost and plagued by equiformality? So, in this talk, I'm going to start to approach some of these questions through the use of landscape evolution models. And so, after providing an overview of the development of, and use of landscape evolution models, I'm going to present two case studies. The first is an example of testing um, alternative models of um, landscape evolution in the context of a post glacial environment. Um, and, and we're going to look at um, how we can use the modern topography to infer what elements of model complexity are actually necessary to capture the dynamics of a particular place. And in the second example, I'm going to uh, look at a synthetic experiment in which I attempt to invert for uh, parameters used to create a synthetic truth with, with increasing levels of difficulty. Um, so to begin, I want to describe the core elements of most landscape evolution models. These include a representation of topography, methods to create and route water, uh, typically diffusion-like erosion and transport, channel erosion and sometimes transport that depends on slope and drainage area. Um, and additionally, many other processes may be represented like um, the generation of soil or vegetation. So landscape evolution models have been used for many applications, uh, including developing insight into the evolution of specific field areas, creating testable predictions um, of landform development, demonstrating the consequences of our thir current theories for geomorphic processes, and sparking our imagination through hypothetical scenarios, which 
somewhat like the example we were just discussing, is you know what what would the Olympic Mountains look like um, under different seismic scenarios? But coupling models of um, Earth surface processes and geodynamic processes totally change the dynamics of the model system. And if we want to couple Earth surface processes models with tectonic and geodynamic processes, we must first be able to create defensible models of Earth surface processes. And I think there are quite a few challenges that we have in the development and application of landscape evolution models. And these include things like um, defining and testing our geomorphic transport laws, the theories that we have for how rock is transformed into mobile material, um, and then moved by uh, wind, water, and ice. And I think we're also quite challenged in developing metrics or statistical abstractions that successfully differentiate between model results that fit data and model results that do not. So in this first case study, I'm going to show you how we can use numerical inversion to determine the appropriate level of complexity for modeling the evolution of topography. Here, we're going to consider how we can use a suite of alternative landscape evolution models in the context of post-glacial landscape evolution to ask the question, how much complexity in the model do we need to capture the dynamics of a field site? So the location of this work is in western upstate New York, shown here by this red dot. And this site um, was glaciated until approximately 13,000 years ago, at which point ice retreated northward. And the um, green, orange, and white domains of uh, this terrain here indicate three important uh, areas in, in this landscape. The white is shale bedrock, uh, the orange is glacial till, and then the green is the fluvial network that's been incised into the till since deglaciation. And the, these two yellow icons here show the location of a nuclear waste reprocessing facility. So now we're going to zoom into this um, dashed box. And so here we have a shaded relief image of the site topography. And work by colleagues in upstate New York determined the age of the most recent uh, retreat in this, of ice retreat in this valley was about 13,000 years ago. And this work also characterized the details of the main stem um, river incision um, through C14 and OSL dating on terraces. So that's shown here. This plot shows the non-steady pattern of fluvial incision of our study watershed's outlet which really serves as a boundary condition for the, the modeling that we did. Um, so years before present are shown on the x-axis and elevation relative to the modern channel is shown on the y-axis. So as you can see, this um, waste site, um, still marked by these yellow icons, sits on a flat-lying till plateau that's been incised by um, this fluvial network. And the location and timing of future erosion in this area um, is relevant for the decisions made in the cleanup of the site. So we were tasked with making predictions of erosion 10,000 years in the future um, with sort of consideration of uncertainty from a variety of sources. And these included um, the structure of the landscape evolution models that we used, the estimation of the parameter values in each of these models, our understanding of um, past and future model boundary conditions related to climate and outlet downcutting. So before describing our study approach, I want to highlight a few of the characteristics of the site that are important for sort of interpreting and thinking about the results. So we're going to zoom into this orange rectangle here and look at a map of slope. So here you can see the terrain uh, colored by a uh, local slope, and, and the location of the site is still marked by the yellow symbols. So as you can see, the side channel slopes are um, nearly planar and, and approach 30 degrees 
Um, there are two major rock types in this watershed. So now we're looking at a slightly different uh, view of the watershed. Um, the outlet is here. The site uh, is located still at these two icons. And here the topography is colored by the depth to bedrock, such that blue means the bedrock is exposed at or very close to the surface, and red means that um, bedrock is um, quite deep and the surface material is a clay-rich glacial till. Um, so, and, and up here we have a sort of a crappy Devonian shale. And so I don't, we don't think, you know, beforehand there's necessarily an obvious uh, reason to think any of either of these materials is more resistant to fluvial erosion. So with that context, I want to sort of give you some information about um, our general approach. So our goal is to predict erosion with quantified uncertainty. And our first step was to develop a set of alternative erosion models. So I'm going to take a brief interlude from the approach and tell you about this set of models. So each model was created using the land lab modeling framework. And all models were um, single variations on the simplest model, which we uh, call the basic model. So this basic model is a linear diffusion and stream power incision uh, model. It, its governing equation is uh, shown here. And it has two free parameters, the stream power coefficient k and the linear diffusivity d. So we identified 12 additional elements of complexity that we thought might be important in better capturing our um, study site. And so these 12 elements of complexity fall into four main categories, hill slope processes, channel processes, hydrology and climate, and, and materials. And I now show all of these 12 options. The default options, those used by the basic model, are shown in bold. So for an example, one change we could make is to say, well, instead of using a linear rule for hill slope sediment flux, we'll use a nonlinear rule. Um, so, and, and sort of based on the steep uh, planar hill slopes that we saw in the prior slide, we might expect that a nonlinear rule would, would really help. So when we have 12 choices, like we do here, that's associated with 12 one element models in which we add one of these um, non default options 66 two element models and 223 element models and so forth. We could have many thousand many element models, and that was just not feasible for us to do. So we um, looked at all 12 one element models. Um, most, many of the 66 two element models, based on um, which ones were actually possible to create, as well as which ones we felt um, might have a sort of an, an interesting interaction. And that, that lent us 37 alternative models that we used in this work. So after developing this set of erosion models, we needed to do a few other things before we could um, calibrate each of our models. We needed to reconstruct topography 13,000 years ago, um, define an objective function, which is our basis for comparing the um, observed topography and um, end of model run results. And so after doing a sensitivity analysis, uh, we calibrated each of those 37 models through a numerical inversion that identified which parameter values um, we should use for each model such that we minimized our uh, objective function is a thing I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. So after calibration was complete, we ran the calibrated models in a validation watershed, selected the best performing models, and um, made our predictions. So right now in this talk, I'm just going to focus on the lessons that we learned from calibration. Um, before showing you some of the results, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about the objective function that we used. So in this study, the modern topography looks quite similar to the topography 13,000 years ago. So here um, on this panel, I show the modern topography, and this is our 
um, 13,000 year ago uh, reconstruction. And so because we expect that our successfully calibrated models are going to create topography that is similar to the modern topography, our objective function is based on just differencing the modern and end of uh, model time topography. But we wanted to place more emphasis in our objective function on these um, channels incising the still plateau. And so we developed a weighting scheme, which I show here, in which this um, yellow colored areas, um, the, the topographic difference there was weighted more heavily. So before showing you these results, I sort of want to step back and ask the question, you know, is this a good natural experiment? Um, and I think it is. So, you know, one thing is that the initial conditions that we have are, are reasonably well constrained. And we also have um, well constrained boundary conditions. And in our modeling effort, we very carefully designed the alternative models that we use so that only one thing changed at a time. Um, one thing that we don't have, uh, however, is an intermediate benchmark or, or things that our models are trying to hit throughout the course of um, the, the time period. So here um, I'm going to show you some of, the, uh, some of the results. So on the left here is uh, the modern topography. Um, and then on the right, this is the calibrated version of the simplest basic model. So as you can see, the uh, model doesn't sort of sufficiently incise in the uh, lower part of the, capture, um, the catchment. And it also over incises in this upper part of the watershed. You can see some grid artifacts uh, located here. And looking carefully at these incised channel slopes, you can see that they're not planar as, as these ones are. And I think many of these failings are to be expected. They're, they're things that are structurally not um, possible in the model. So before I go on and show you some more of the results, I want to briefly discuss sort of our approach to interpretation. So, we can expect that a more complicated model should best a simpler model in terms of having a lower objective function value because it typically you could have more parameters and thus more degrees of freedom. So we can assess each calibrated model and ask the question, is it better? So if the answer is yes, after we've accounted for the total number of parameters, we can include, conclude that this new element of complexity um, has added to our ability to capture the dynamics of that particular system. And if the answer is no, we can assess if the calibrated um, parameter values are trying to recapture the simpler um, version of the model. So for example, if we had tried to add a threshold in the um, stream erosion, and that threshold was calibrating to be equal to zero, we could say, well, you know, we're, we're being told that that threshold definitely does not add to our ability to capture the model as defined by the objective function. So with this context, I'm going to show you the three additional model elements that provided the most benefit to having a good model data fit. But before I do, I want to ask you guys, which one of these 12 elements of complexity do you think add the most? Don't be shy. Okay, well, we'll, we'll bedrock, okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, so we have bedrock and variability of climate. Turns out that in this particular case, variability of climate never improved the results. I, however, I do not think that that is a statement that should be generalized. I think it's very specific this site, this objective function, and so forth. Um, so it turned out that the most important difference is the differentiation between rock and till. And so, you know, some of you thought that this was an obvious addition. Um, so here on the upper right, we have the, the basic model, which I showed before, and the basic model with the rock and till units. And so um, what you can see is that now that um, we have um, the ability for different erodibility coefficients, we're incising less in this upstream part of the catchment and we're incising more in this lower part of the watershed. So the second biggest improvement was adding an um, erosion threshold. So 
as with what we saw um, before we have the modern topography um, shown now, the basic model with the rock and hill units, um, and now with an erosion threshold. And so what I think you should see is that we're now able to incise a little bit more into the upper part of the watershed, and there's a bigger differentiation here between being on the plateau surface and, and in the main channel. The final thing that made a big difference was the addition of a nonlinear hill slope component. So here we have the modern, the um, rock and till units, and the erosion threshold, and um, the, the best model that we were able to make which has these three um, elements of complexity. Um, and just for reference, these are the types of calibrated parameters that we, were, we came up with. And so, you know, these are reasonable, like we are ending up with sort of a critical slope of about 20 degrees. So what did we learn from this calibration? That correctly capturing this landscape requires differentiating between lithologies, using an erosion threshold, and including the nonlinear hill slopes. But before moving on to the next piece, I want to ask the question, are these improvements that we've made um, in adding elements of complexity linearly independent? That is to say, is adding the erosion threshold and nonlinear hill slope element the same as the sum of the effect of adding each of these? independently. So to address this, let's look carefully at each of these calibrated models. So here we have the basic model with rock and hill units, um, the erosion, uh, the model in which we've just added the erosion threshold. And as I said before, you know, this means that we're incising a little bit extra in this upper part of the watershed. We're also um, having less erosion on the plateau than in the channels. But if you just add the nonlinear hill slope model uh, to this basic rock hill model, you end up making the exact same result as, as this one here. And the, the parameter value for the critical slope ends up trying to calibrate to be such that you know you have um, sort of linear um, linear uh, sediment flow. And it is only when you have both. Um, the erosion threshold and the nonlinear hill slopes, that um, the slope parameter uh, is able to calibrate to a value such that you sort of create these um, planar hill slopes. And so our interpretation here is that without the erosion threshold, the smaller drainages in size too much, lighting off a large hill slope response that is uh, too big. And so by limiting the um, channel incision with the threshold, and we are able to have a more appropriate hill slope response. So, you can answer this question in this context, the answer is no. So, to summarize, we can use numerical inversion to identify wet model elements, improve model performance. And I think that this is a very exciting approach for testing um, our ideas in landscape evolution. And, and you know, I showed that the effects are not necessarily linearly independent. And a point that I'd like to make that I think is really fascinating is that everything that I've said is really conditioned on the specific objective function to use to compare the models and data. And that's really the way that we communicate through a, a numerical inversion method, like what we think is important. So I think you know, exploring how our results change and um, that objective function is different is, is of interesting so in the remaining time, I want to tell you about um, a synthetic experiment um, in which I infer exploring geologic and tectonic parameters. So the last experiment really brings up a question to me, which are what are the limits of inverting topography? And clearly there are limits. So you know, if we have equicanality in the slope area relationships in detachment limited and transport limited alluvial incision, you know, it's not going to be easy or possible to say something about what the process is from, you know, that, um, um, from that information in, in a steady case. And then this exercise, I was really inspired by a lot of examples from the literature, things like um, this work by Michaela Tall and others thinking about the Long Valley profiles and a foot wall of a normal fault and um, understanding whether or not this river system is transport or detachment limited. Um, things like work on the Messinian salinity crisis, um, inferring mantles 
viscosity from lace bonneville shorelines and the morphological dating of fault scarps. So I think we can consider that there are some number of model parameters that we would like to back out from topography. These might include material strength, resistivity, transport lake scale, how we represent a process, the timing of faulting, and so forth. And, and in reality, we don't know what the actual answer is, so it's very difficult to assess if the methods that we have are able to actually distinguish between alternative options. So in this experiment, what I'm gonna do is create a synthetic proof that's based on a known model with known parameter values. And I'm gonna test how well I can recover the true parameter values given sort of a plausible parameter range. Then I'm gonna look at what happens when I add noise and, and use that to sort of constrain our ability to use landscape evolution models to recover this desired information. So I did this in a model that I set up using the Land Lab modeling framework. And I used a hexagonal model grid with two process components, the stream power with alluvium conservation and entrainment component, and an exponentially decaying uh, a generation of other transportable material. And I use this space model because it's able to capture both the transport and detachment limited behavior of alluvial incision through parameter choice. So this model runs for eight million years and then vertical faulting begins. And this is a very simple um, fault in the context of a sort of pretend geodynamic uh, part of the model. So I've set this model up to have two parameters. The faulting duration is between zero and four million years, corresponding to a highly transient system and a system that's long reached its steady state. And then I created a parameter which I'm calling the process parameter, and it controls both the fraction of fine sediment that once detached is permanently detached and um, removed from the system, as well as the um, production rate of the other component, the exponentially decaying production of transportable material. And when this parameter has a value of zero, the system is fully transport limited, and when it's um, a value of one, it's detachment limited. And for each possible value of this uh, process parameter, I set the rock and sediment erodibility such that the steady state slope area relationship is exactly the same. So here is an example of the long profile evolution of these two end member cases. On the left, we have the transport limited case, right, the detachment limited case. This line shows the profile of the largest channel in this model domain at um, 100,000 year time slices. And as, um, so we have elevation and normalized distance upstream here. And as you can see, the, the transient response in these two cases very different. In the transport limited case, you know, the profile spins uh, everywhere, whereas in the detachment limited case, it spins first um, near the outlet. So these two animations show the end members of our cases in slope area space. And so the x axis is log of drainage area, and the y axis is log of slope. The black dots show all of the nodes that are faulted, and these green dots here show just the nodes that are in the longest profile. So in this exercise, I'm going to use the, uh, an objective function that is based on this slope area relationship um, for this long, the largest channel in the um, faulted domain. And so um, here is an example of, say this is our, our synthetic truth, and I'm gonna compare that synthetic truth with a variety of candidate parameter sets to see how well we can recover what the truth is based on um, the slope area information. So before, before showing you the results, I wanna introduce you to a plot that we're gonna see a few times. So on the um, y-axis, we have faulting duration, and on the x-axis, we have the process parameter and transport limited over here, detachment limited over here. Um, we're gonna have a red star that marks the true parameter combination. 
And this color bar here shows the um, log of the objective function value. And so eventually we're going to see color over this entire area that corresponds to goodness of fit that, uh, to the synthetic truth. And so this was calculated by running a candidate model um, at every single point in this parameter space. So I want to orient you to the values of the objective function. And so you can see what they mean for the difference between the true and candidate uh, parameter sets. And so this uh, comparison has a log objective function value of negative 0 0.7. It's a pretty bad fit. And these two have values of negative 2 and negative 3. And so I think we can sort of calibrate our minds to saying that a good fit is sort of in the yellow and green colors. So um, what we're now going to do is look at some results. So this red star is going to show us the true parameter calibration. And so I'm going to reveal the colors back here. You know, if we can perfectly recover the information about our system, which is the yellow blob right here near this um, red star, what you end up seeing is this. So we have um, a, a yellow region that's extending here across this process parameter. Um, and we also, we see some numerical striping in this area, and, and I haven't fully figured out if that's related to the model or the objective function or some interaction between the two. And so I think what this shows is in this, uh, if we're using the slope area relationship as our objective function, in this highly idealized case in which I use the exact same initial topography random seed as an initiation of the model, that, you know, we wouldn't be able to necessarily tell where we are other than to say we're not attachment limited, um, but we would infer the timing of the faulting uh, reasonably well. So now I made this a little bit more complicated. I used a different random seed to generate the initial condition topography. And so this is what these results look like. As you can see, um, this has changed a bit, the area of this yellow blob, and um, we would still have uncertainty process parameter that we were trying to infer, and, and there's a bit more um, uncertainty in the timing of faulting as shown by the sort of spreading out of these yellow and green colors. So let's make this one more step complicated. Here I've added normally distributed random noise to the erodibility coefficient for rock and sediment used by the space model. Um, and I've added a different random field at every single time step. And so that's what it looks like now. If you can see, um, we now probably conclude that the process parameter is somewhere in the middle of transport limited and detachment limited, even though the truth is, is out here much closer to, to transport limited. And, and I think we still have some you know, additional uncertainty in the timing of fault onset. So one thing that's interesting about doing this in a very synthetic case is I can ask the question, well, how would these results be different if the true parameter combination was out here? And the answer is that, you know, our ability to infer the parameters is very different. So here, I think because the nature of the um, transient detachment limited slope area relationship is sort of so characteristic, you know, even with um, the noise I've added to the erodibility coefficient, we still have good constraint on both the timing and the, this process parameter. So in this exercise, I hope I've convinced you of the utility of synthetic experiments to identify the limits of our ability to infer geomorphic and tectonically relevant parameters. And this is clearly a very simple example with a simple model and a simple objective function. And other examples have been done and, and published thinking about you know, using more complicated objective functions like incorporating um, information from multiple drainage basins of different sizes as well as thermochronologic data. But I think the point that I'd like to make is that synthetic exercises like this are really useful in providing us with information about when we can expect our data to retain information about the targets of inversion and when we cannot. And I think this can really be used for uh, to help us develop better uh, methods for, for comparing models and data that we actually 
you know, feel confident are, go are going to hold up. So, in summary, at the beginning of the talk, I provided a little bit of background related to the nature and use of landscape evolution models. And then we looked at a case study of post-glacial landscape evolution in which we use the modern topography to infer what elements of complexity were necessary to capture the landscape. Then we um, looked at a synthetic experiment um, in which we explored the limits of our ability to invert for uh, topography for desired quantities in morphology and tectonics. And so I think the approach I presented has a lot of promise, but many challenges still remain. And so I'd like to conclude with some thoughts to motivate future work with particular attention to work that requires coupling of surface and geodynamic velocity. So first, the two examples that I showed are from highly transient systems. And you know, how must our methods uh, be different when working in steady versus transient case studies? Also, many of the modeled structures structure choices and model coupling choices that we might make are really categorical. And so that brings up the question, you know, when we are, are assessing, you know, how, is our model good enough? Our, our, our ability to um, calibrate the model good enough? You know, how must that be different when we're dealing with both continuous and categorical choices? And finally, I think the result of the natural experiment, which I showed that the benefit of adding one additional process is not linearly additive provides a challenge in that it shows how nonlinear actions can potentially mask the effect of an additive process. So if we just had added the nonlinear hill slope without adding an erosion threshold, we might conclude we don't need nonlinear hill slopes. This doesn't add anything. And so, you know, this will only become more, more of a challenge when we're dealing with coupled models. How, how shall we? addressing that. So with that, I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Katie. Questions? Uh, we need it, we need it for the, the online right, okay. uh, So I have a question regarding tectonics in general. So. Um, because in your first case study, um, I don't want to add another uh, complexity to it, but I think um, tectonics should be added because tectonics on the long term scale is not only variable, uh, it might actually uh, be differential across the landscape. So, um, for example, accounting for even though it's a post glacial landscape, you don't expect any uh, kind of full trust belt tectonics, but there is that element where you might have, for example, an isostatic rebound have that tectonic element. In the second case, if you uh, maybe in the future could consider a variability in the faulting rate, because um, that is over 10 million years you modeled, that yeah. might vary as well. So a fault is not steadily at one rate in 10 million years. Of course, it's an idealist model, but I think that needs to be added, the tectonic element to the, in a more yeah, um, rigorous way. Yeah, so those are two really great points. I think, so, we, we spent a long time trying to decide how, if at all, we needed to do sort of post-glacial rebound, tilting, and so forth in the first case. Um, I, uh, we, we ended up concluding that, that the amount of, of um, that effect in this place on the 13,000 year time scale that we were modeling for was, was small enough that we weren't gonna do it, but but I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, I think you, you end up, this, this sort of leads into the, the second question, which is that, you know, ultimately, we know a lot about different processes that operate in the Earth system. And I think there's a general question that you can ask, which is, you know, what do you do when you can't include them all? There are, there are obviously problems with including them all. Um, you may, in the words of, or Molnar end up with something you just don't understand even more. Um, but you know, I, I, I think you, you sort of you end up in a situation in which um, ultimately the, the approach that I like to think about is, you know, can you, since you know that you're never going to actually be able to include every component, sort of carefully adding components and understanding, like, okay, well, in this 
simple faulting exercise, how different is my result if I include a more realistic faulting pattern in which I have some distribution of um, timing between faulting events? And then I, I think the other thing that this really sort of brings up is the question of, you know, important for what? You know, we have, there, there are established methods for assessing, like, if adding a piece of model complexity or changing a parameter value impacts a thing, assuming you're able to define what that thing is. So, you know, a, a big question that all of this work brings up for me is, how do we define our, our methods for model data comparison so that they're actually sensitive to the things that we want them to be sensitive for? And then, you know, you may have a situation in which you have the same model applied in two different contexts with two different sort of targets, and you know, you decide, you end up concluding that different things are important. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, I'd encourage folks to introduce themselves when they talk since we don't all know each other. I'm Cindy Ebinger. I'm from the Bay University. And I wanted to follow on, <coughs> sorry, a little bit with that question in a way and saying even with the first example, you have GIA in the area and as we're <coughs> oh sorry we're seeing from the microscope mantle imaging that there may be more than just that as well and so tilting and regional tilting at, at isostatic scales of football up there but also at regional tilting and regional dynamics is kind of redefining in a way the way that we look at what steady state is so steady state to Anyone looking at GPS after an earthquake sees the coastline and they can either go, you know, if it really falls off and the exponential curve falls off, you'd say, all right, we're approaching steady state. But with regional tilting and and um, and their and their influences on uh, some of the landscape evolution, is that something that's on the radar? Because I guess it sort of keeps evolving with regional tilting. I I would say that the example that most closely comes to my mind when thinking about this is you know, um, work by someone uh, like Andy Wickert, who thought a lot about how post um, uh, Laurentide ice sheet demise um, and the sort of uh, changes in the topography that or the, the gross topography that comes from um, the um, the geodynamics influence the reorganization of river basin systems in the, the entire sort of United States and Canada and with a main focus on Mississippi River drainage. But I, I don't, I would say, um, I think you know, whether it's paid attention to or not is a, is a patchy fact. Um, but, you know, I think one, uh, one thing that, you know, both your questions bring up is that, you know, if there are Sort of main process components, things like doing um, GIA right, you know, having tools that connect well with our surface processes and models, such that you know someone who is thinking about this question can include it or assess the question: if I include it or not, does it actually make a difference? Um, you know, when when does it make a difference? For what things do I want to think about? Does it make a difference? It's a really good. Um, this is Torsten Becker, UT. So, um, suppose when you look at landscape evolution, there are certain players like the bedrock type and wherever we have a fault or not that are inherited or pretty much impossible to predict. So, those are important for certain sites to constrain. But then, on the other hand, you have a set of processes that are hopefully universal and that would be nice to understand in a more general sense. And speaking about those, you nicely highlighted the trade-offs between some of them. And I just wonder, you know, in your case, you were asking, well, I go from A to B, and then you have these trade-offs, and it's hard to tell if it's the limit in erodibility or the nonlinearity that's more important. If you were to design your ideal experiment, what would that be? And what would the things be that you would be looking at to get at the process sort of constraints? Is it studying the... Uh, amount of sediments when they were deposited, the output of the system, is it constraining 
the uplift rates and where would you invest most of the money if you had your ideal experiment to reduce those trade-offs? Can, 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 I, can I answer the question at the end of the conference tomorrow? <laughs> but I mean, you, you must have some feeling from the models yeah. already, right? You, you can keep track of the sediments and you go like, oh, it's nonlinear, it does that. Yeah. It's, it's limited is this. Oh, if I could only measure that, then I could nail it down. I follow up with you on that one. <laughs> Sorry. But oh, I have a thought though that is related to a point that you made, which is that you know, we we made these 37 alternative models in which we made one or two or three changes. And you know, at some level you'd like to think that we could use one model for the surface of the earth that would include all the things the one thing we thought a lot about after having developed all of these sorts of things is, okay, well, you know, what, what, so we did this in the, in the land lab landscape evolution modeling framework, which is this sort of modular um, Python package for creating um, models grids and having different process components. It's very easy to swap, you know, a, a different component that does fluvial and out for a different one and then then you can just do that. But so like what you know given this suite of things that we created, you know, how what what would we need to do to create one model that through parameter choice permitted us to capture the whole range from the um the, uh, from those thirty seven models. And I think this this ultimately got me thinking about sort of what happens when you have these sort of continuous choices and the, the categorical choices in in the modeling that you're doing and, and, and how do you um, modify your approach if, if you're really trying to invert for something that you know at the beginning you're thinking of as categorical, but you'd really like to think of as actually 